Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. We praise you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for the rivers of living water. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise you, Father. We glorify your name, Lord. Here we are, Lord Jesus. Here we are today, Lord Jesus, the first, the first day, the first day of 2014. Father, you have brought us to this place. Father, for this appointed time, Lord Jesus, you have called forth every person that is in this place for this appointed time to do this great thing that you've called us to do in this city, oh God. And we thank you, Father, for all of those in this place that truly say with all of their heart and will hold nothing back. Here I am, oh Lord Jesus. Here I am, Lord Jesus. Here I am. Use me. Send me, oh God. Here I am, oh God. Here I am, Lord. Take all of me. All of me, Lord. I pour out my life. I pour out my life. I empty myself. And I pour out my life on you, Jesus. I spend my life on you, Lord. I spend my everything on you, Lord. Lord Jesus. Take all of me, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. Oh, Father, may we hold dear those things that you have done and those things that you purpose to do those things that you've anointed us to do by your Holy Ghost in this place Lord as a body together in this place as we stand here father is a part of the body upon this earth Lord the body right here in this place for the purposes and the plans that you have for us to do father God may we count it dear may we count it dear father that we are included we are included in the things that you've called us to do, oh God, these great things. Lord Jesus, to see your glory revealed in power, in demonstration. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, that you baptized us in the fire of the Holy Ghost to show forth your glory. We ask you, Father, to baptize us afresh in the fire of the Holy Ghost and cause us, oh God, to forget everything else, to forget about our issues, to forget about the cares and the pleasures of this world, to forget about the problems that would arise, and, Father, to get our eyes upon the purposes that you have placed before us to do those things, oh God, that you have called us to do. May we be found in your righteousness and in your truth and in your holiness that you're appearing, oh God. <laughs> oh, doing those things that please you, Father. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord, here we are. Here we are. I, I look out here and I see a valiant people that God has brought in this place. A people that are handpicked and chosen by God to be where God has called us to be at this moment and at this time. And today, I pray, Lord, that we hear your Holy Spirit. And Lord, you come and you reign in our lives, each and every one of us. Just say, Lord, come and reign in me. Me, Lord, me, that he may reign upon this earth. Oh, Father, let your fire burn. Let it burn. Let it burn in us, oh God. Let it be like a fire shut up in our bones that we cannot contain. Oh God, let our focus, let our eyes be upon you. Oh Lord Jesus, that your word be our delight. That we shine with your glory, the glory of your presence. Because you are our delight. Your word is our delight. Your truth is our delight. Oh, Lord, your judgments are our delight. Walking in obedience is the delight of our heart. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Father. Oh, thank you, Father. You know, I know so many of you faithfully prayed for God to bring us to this place that we are right now. And I am talking about this property in particular. And I know many of you prayed. 
that God would give us this property. And I know one time I was down and I was interceding before the Lord, and I, you know, and I'm just asking God, Lord, you know, search me. Am I being careless in any way? You know, I just, I, my heart was like, Father, I know I heard you. I know you said, go in, get your foot on that property, possess that property. And, you know, we kept having postponement and postponement and postponement. And I tell you, people, I believe God was trying some of our hearts. He was seeing if we would hook up with the Holy Spirit and what he was saying. And we would really, with all of our heart, take a hold of this. And I begin to pray, Father, Father, as you give us this property, Lord, I will be faithful. Lord, I will press in and I will do those things that, you will call, that you've called us to do on this property. Lord Jesus, I will put my hand to the plow like I've not put my hand to the plow before. And I will do the work that you've called us to do. I will. I give myself, Lord. I mean, each and every one of us have to say that for ourselves. Lord, I'll put aside the things that I think that I might need to have to accomplish. And Lord, I will put my hand to the plow and I will do, I will do, Lord Jesus, what you called us to do on this property. And I mean, and you know, I'd like to know if there's anybody else that prayed that prayer. I mean, you know, if you don't want to raise your hand, it's fine. But I mean, I prayed and I cried out to God and I said, Lord, I will, I will, here I am, I will, here I am. And I was talking to Pastor Mark yesterday and I told him, I said, you know, Pastor Mark, as I was on my knees interceding for this property and crying out to God for this property, this is what I was praying. And he said, Geneva, I prayed the exact same thing. I know that this is what the Holy Spirit is saying. I know, I know without a doubt that God will completely give us this entire property if we will take this as serious as the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are taking it. If we will look at this opportunity, this divine opportunity, and we will grab a hold of it and we will say, here I am, Father. Lord, I will fulfill every bit of the part that you place in my heart for this work. Lord, I will come and I will build your house. I will leave the cities back in Babylon. I will leave the houses we built and the inheritance and the things that we have there laid up for our children. And I'll walk away and go out to this land that I can see nothing but a burned up city and we need to just restore the wall. And I will do, Lord Jesus, what you've given in our hand to do. And I will work and I will labor. There's a lot of work and a lot of labor and a lot of giving of yourself to accomplish what God wants done in the earth. He chooses to use men to show forth his glory. You know, and, and as I'm, I'm, I'm praying today, I'm hearing Psalms chapter 2, verse 8. Ask me, ask me, ask me, and I shall give you the heathen for your inheritance and the other most parts of the earth for your possession. Hallelujah. Ask me. Just ask me. Father's just waiting on us to seriously ask him and to take a hold of that promise. Be those that inherit the promise of the most high God. Inherit it. Oh, it's his pleasure for us to delight in the work that he does in us and through us. And all we have to do is ask him. And he will give us the heathen. Oh, Jesus. And I think of, I think of Japan. We've been visiting with Japan the last several days. Show in Chicago. And his father in Ishami, Isami, I, I don't got, have the names all down, but I'm going to get them because I'm going to get a hold of Japan like never before. I'm going to get a hold of Japan right here in San Diego. I know God's going to send Japan right here, right here in this place. Oh, could you imagine if we could raise up Japanese people with the fire of the Holy Ghost, if we can get a hold of people right here in San Diego that are from Japan, are people that have a heart burning for Japan, and we could just raise them up in the school of the spirit and the school of evangelism and the school of missions and then send them to Japan to rock Japan? Do you know that 
percent of Japan is, Pan is some kind of a Protestant, or not quite 0.4 percent, is some kind of a Protestant Christian. But very few have ever come to the power, any kind of power gospel, any kind of power of the Holy Spirit. Now we're looking at 10 million people that live in Tokyo, 30 million people that work in Tokyo, and 0.4% of the entire nation has heard the gospel to some extent. And a very few percentage of them have heard the power gospel, the signs, the wonders, and the miracles. Lord Jesus, my heart has broken I heard that last night for the first time. I knew it was 1%, and I was already pretty, I mean, that's what I'd heard before, and I was pretty broken up about that. But 0.4%? Jesus. I said, where has America been? Where are the missionaries to Japan? This is a free nation. This is a nation that is open for anybody to come in. You don't get put in prison in Japan for go preaching the gospel. Where are the people? Where are the intercessors that cry out for the souls of Japan? That break down the strongholds and the powers of darkness that the, preach, the preaching of the gospel can have free course in Japan? Where are those that will give their life to intercede for the nations? That intercede for San Diego that the powers of intellectualism and, and pride and arrogancy will be broken that the gospel can have free course? Where are the intercessors that will cry out to God day and night till we're given the city? God said Jerusalem and then the uttermost parts of the earth. God says this is Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem intercede as he's given us the rest other parts of the earth. But I tell you what, Japan, Japan is now in my sights like never before. My heart is breaking. I told David today, I'm like the millions of people that have died without the gospel in one nation alone, in just Japan alone. And then the nations, oh God, let us not hold on to our life, but let us be those that don't count our lives dear to ourselves and be those that will lose our lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That will care about those that are on their way to hell. You have been given so much. We have been given so much. We have so freely heard the word of God. And we let little penny any issues hold us back from the glory and the partaking of reaping the harvest. Oh God, no more. No more. Oh God, when these little trials come against each and every one of us, may we say, Lord, here I am. These things are not important to me. Lord, I don't want to count my life dear to myself. I don't want to go and have a whining pity party about me any longer. Oh God, I want to see the nations change for the glory of the gospel. I want to be responsible to what you put into my hand, oh God. I want to be responsible with this glory. I want to be responsible with this power that you placed on the inside of me. Oh, God, I want to put away entertainment and cares and worldly pleasures and cry out to you, Father, for the lost. Cry out to you, Father, for the laborers. Lord, raise up laborers. Lord, raise up laborers because truly, truly the harvest is white. It is white unto harvest. Oh, Father, send forth the laborers. And Lord, let it begin with me. Oh, God, let me be the laborer. Let me hold my, my mouth silent no longer. No longer let me hold silent. But let me speak and declare your word. Oh, God, give us free course. You know, this comes first in intercession and prayer and crying out to God. That his word can go forth. Paul said, continually pray for me that utterance may be given. Yes. That I might boldly declare the word of God. Yes. Every one of us, we need to pray for ourselves and one another. Yes. That utterance may be given that we may boldly declare the word of the Lord. Yes. That we may boldly, boldly declare the word of the Lord. Yes. That we do not hold back. We do not let the enemy put the gag order on our mouth and keep us silent. 
but we boldly stand and declare his word with signs and wonders, with the glory of Jesus present upon us. Oh, thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Your glory, Father. Your glory manifested in us. And this reminds me, Tuesday night will be the School of Evangelism. And we're going to be at the School of Evangelism strategizing how to take by the Holy Ghost and power the city of San Diego. And we're going to start with the radius right around the church. And I begin to pray. I've been praying for years. Father, let the glory of God be so powerful in this church. And Father, in Jesus' name, I'm just going to tell you right now, I bind hurt feelings. I bind hurt feelings, people hurting each other's feelings and, and people in, in, excluding and only including certain people and, and people feeling just, you know, just that whole feeling of I'm left out, nobody cares about me. I bind that in Jesus' name. I bind it. You, you need to realize that that's a stinking demon spirit. And you're not going to take part of it. Anyways, hello, you're the head, not the tail. Nobody made you the tail when you're in Jesus Christ. You're the head. Everybody's looking at you wanting to know how they can be a part of, of you because you shine with the glory of God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. We're going we're gonna to put aside stupidity in Jesus' name. Stupidity. Because that's what it is. And we're just going to shine with the glory of Jesus Christ. Proverbs 11.30. The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. And he that wins souls is wise. Hallelujah. The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. And he that wins souls is wise. And then Daniel 12, 3. And I'm doing this kind of quickly because I just feel like we, I'm going to move on here. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. I like that. Everybody turn to Daniel. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. Daniel 12, verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. I mean, even Daniel, way back when, <laughs> he was saying, this is the call of God upon the righteous to turn, the wise to turn many to righteousness so you can shine with the light and the glory of God because this is his purpose for us to be the light shining in this earth, us to be a city set upon a hill that cannot be hid, absolutely cannot be hid. I don't care what the government says. I don't care about how the government tries to stomp out our light or how the city uh, it tries to stomp out our light or what goes on. Our light can't be stopped out because we got the Holy Ghost and fire living on the inside of us that shines brighter than the noon, day, sun, that glory. That glory, that glory. And it says here, shining brighter than the stars. Shining brighter than the stars. Hallelujah. Those that turn people. You want to shine with the glory of God. Take what the Holy Spirit has given you and begin to give it out. And as you give it out, that anointing will be strengthened and increased. And you will grow in that glorious light of liberty. And we will begin to take stronger dominion over the atmosphere of San Diego County. As we step out in what God's called us to do, we will take stronger dominion over the atmosphere. We will take authority over the atmosphere. You know, you stand, every one of you stand as a representative of authority over the atmosphere of darkness. And as you move out more in God, that increases and increases and increases. And then one put a thousand to flight, two put 10,000 to flight. And you get the glory of God shining on you and you take your baby with you and your baby will be a third one or, or whoever, whatever. 
that increase of that unity and that glory shining brighter and brighter and brighter. We are the people of God. We have been given all the authority that the Son has bestowed upon us. And he said, what I hear of the Father that I give, what he's given me, I give you. All power and authority is given unto me. Now, he charges his church. He charges you. It's a charge. It's a commission. It's the great commission. It's the commission of authority and power, not of wimpiness and cowardness. It's the commission that will stand in front and face death and not be changed. You look at the greatness of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You look at the greatness of Daniel, of Joseph, the my, these mighty men of God, and you look at what it took to get them there. You know, we can take Joseph and we can look at Joseph and we can see how, as a young man, God, the presence of God was upon him. He was a goodly man. He was a, right, he was a righteous young man. There was righteousness upon him. There was favor upon him. Jacob didn't just favor him because he was born of Rachel, but he favored him because the presence of God was upon him because of the call of God was upon him. And Joseph, he's, he's having these dreams. Because why? Because Joseph chose to do what was right. His brothers weren't choosing to do what was so right. But Joseph, like Jacob, chose to do what's right. Ishmael chose to go and marry wives of the Canaanites. He chose to do those things that weren't pleasing to the father. But jo Jacob, he was waiting on God's plans and purposes for his life. You know, so I'll stay over here with the story of Joseph. Here, Joseph, he has the dreams of the, of the wheat being bundled and his brother's wheat all bowing down before his. And then he has the dream of the sun and the moon and the stars bowing down before him. And he was ridiculed for those dreams. He was hated for those dreams. He was despised for those dreams. He was despised for the coat his father gave him. He was despised for that honor that was bestowed upon him from the heavenly father. See, that honor of royalty and that honor of handing on to Joseph the authority of the nation that would soon be the nation of Israel, that authority handed upon him was of the Father. That coat of many colors came from the Father. But that coat of many colors cost Joseph a whole lot. It, was a, it came, that anointing came of great cost. There was a great price in that because it brought such jealousy among his brethren for that anointing that was placed upon him. Oh. And he was caught, and his coat was ripped, and he was thrown into the pit, and then sold into slavery. You know, here he was, just a child, just a young, a young boy, maybe 15, 16 years old. And his brothers sold him into slavery. And, you know, he had to be just like us. And thank God you, you gave me these dreams. Father, you put your coat upon me of many colors. Father, you anointed me. Father, I have been obedient to you. Lord, I have obeyed and done what you commanded me to do. And here I am, sold into slavery. Here I am, now sold into Potiphar's house. And things looked a little good for a little bit. He's still sold into slavery. He's still a slave. But God blessed everything he did, and God gave him favor. So there was some encouragement, but he's still a slave. You know, the man that, that uh, the sun, moon, and stars are bowing down to. When, when is that ever going to happen? What, what was that? That is a forgotten dream now. No. Joseph was holding on to it because the blessing of the Lord was upon everything he did. So for the blessing of the Lord to be upon everything that Joseph did, he must with an, be with an obedient heart to God in everything. 
already forgiving his brothers, already releasing all of the hurt and all of the pain and all the suffering that being sold by your family into slavery would, would bring upon anyone. You know, you can just, we could just pick anybody in here right now, wrap them up, tie them up, throw them in a pit, and then wait for the Ishmaelites to come along, or the, yeah, I think it was Ishmaelites, come along and, you know, sell one of you into slavery. And, you know, we all gathered up and we decided that your coat of many colors was too bright, that your righteousness was too much for us, so we need to sell you into slavery. I mean, just think about that. Be in, be in that situation with Joseph. And Joseph, because the blessing was upon him, we know he released all, all of those things that would be hurt and disappointment over what was being done to him. But God wasn't done trying him. Here comes Potiphar's wife and makes more trouble for him. And then he's put into prison on top of being a slave. If being a slave wasn't enough, now he's a slave that's put into prison. But we know he released and he surrendered everything and he didn't sit in a whining pity party. But he released everything to the Father. He said, here I am, Lord. Here I am, right in the midst of this prison. Oh, God, you brought me here. You brought me here, Father. And here I am, take all of me. I pour out my life on you, Father. I pour out my life on you, Jesus. I'm here for you, Lord. Because you know why he, we know he said that? You know why that, we know that commitment was there? Because God blessed everything he did in the jail, and he became the ruler of the prison. And the blessing of God can only be upon a person like that because they choose to surrender every issue that faces them in their life unto the Father and say, here I am, Lord, take all of me. I'm not going to hold on to it. I'm not going to allow anything to stop me from the purpose and the plan that you have for my life. I will not allow the circumstances of this life to stop me and hold me back from these purposes that you have for me, God. And I'll stay right here in this prison. I'll stay right here in this jail, Father, till you work every perfect thing in me and you make me and you bring me to that place. You form me and you fashion me and you bring me to that place that you've called me to be. Because what Father is doing and what we must allow him to do in us at all times is to form us and to fashion us into that image, that person that will stand in the midst of greatness and hold on and carry the light and the glory of the gospel in the midst of the greatness. It comes with a great cost to do great things in God. And all of that time, Joseph was doing things in God. People are all looking around at him and saying, your God is God. Look at the blessing of God is upon Joseph. I mean, he's a, he's a witness. He's a testimony of the God of heaven. Everywhere he goes and everything that he's due, he's a testimony. He's showing forth the God of gods. Because he comes, he comes before Pharaoh. And everybody's been praying to all of these things and doing their sorcery and their witchcraft and throwing their little stuff in the pot and stirring it up and trying to come up with something, some kind of idea to be able to give Pharaoh the interpretation of his dream. And nothing's working. They're praying to all of their gods. You know, back in, with Jacob, you know, Jake, Jacob's um, father-in-law, they're all praying to their gods. And then they're looking at Jacob, and Jacob, he's praying to the God that cannot be seen. He's, he's not praying to a God made out of stone or made out of wood, but he's praying to the God of heaven and earth. He's praying to the creator of all things, and everything that Jacob does is blessed, and they're looking at him. They're looking at this testimony, but it looks like Jacob's a slave. It doesn't look like he's the ruler of a people that will be as the, uh, the stars of heaven, as the sand of the sea. It doesn't look like he's the, the head of a, a, a great nation. It looks like he's a slave. But God's perfecting things in him so he can bring him out and use him to that extent. And God's perfecting things in Joseph when he's in that prison. But I tell you what. I tell you what, the faithfulness of Joseph continued and continued and continued to one day he was brought. He was brought before Pharaoh. And in one moment, in one day, he was made second 
to the ruler of the greatest nation upon the earth. They said, all, the scripture says, all the world. Because Egypt was basically the world back then. And he was made second. He was one day in prison, and in a moment, he's brought before the Pharaoh. And in a moment, as the God of creation speaks to him and brings the interpretation of the dream, everything changes, and he's the savior of his people, Israel. He saves the people of Israel because he was found faithful before God, because he would not bend or bow like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They would not bend or bow. They said, oh, king, hear me, hear me. Our God is able to deliver us. But if he doesn't deliver us, be it known unto you. You know, and how dare back then you speak to a king like that, but be it known unto you. We will not bow to you. We will not bow to any God on this earth, but we will bow our knee to the God of heaven and him alone we serve. Whoo, I tell you, I'd like to have been back there in that revival and saw that when, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace when they threw them in, and there they stand. And there they stand. And the glory of the presence of the Almighty comes and stands right there with them. And the fire is burning so hot that the people that threw them in were caught up and exploded in the fire, burnt up in the fire as they threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that fiery furnace because it was heated up seven times hotter because the king got mad because he was king. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood in that fire just glow in the glory of the presence of the Almighty because they were not going to allow anything to stop them from being obedient to God. And they stood as a testimony to that heathen nation of there is one God, the creator of all things, and we will worship him and him alone. And so here comes the king looking, says, bring them out. And he looks at them and he's like, your hair is not singed. Not even a part of your clo clothes are singed. You don't even have the smell of smoke on you. And what does he declare? Everybody in this nation serve the God that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego serve. Hallelujah. God uses man. God uses you. Will we be like Daniel that says, look, you know, you decree a decree to throw me to the lions. If I pray, I'm going to pray. Just here I am, Lord. Take all of me. And you know, David, that song, the Holy Ghost gave David that song just at that time of, as we're interceding for this building. And you, you need to look at what the Holy Spirit is saying and the prophecy that is going forth and what Father is speaking. And it's not just words that should be coming out of our mouth as we're worshiping Him, but it should be, oh God, here I am in this place because you brought me here. And Father, I want to be found faithful to what you have called me to do. I want to be found faithful. Father, I don't want to be caught up in busyness of this life. I don't want to be caught up in, in the cares of this life, but I want to be caught up in what your purposes and your plans are for me. Father, I, I leave it all behind. Father, no matter what it costs me. Daniel, it was going to cost him his life. In the lion's den. But he would not let go of his purpose, and he bowed his knee. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And of course, he was, thrown into, he was thrown into the lion's den. But the, the Lord sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth. And the king comes running after staying up all night trying to figure out something for Daniel. The king comes running and says, Daniel, was your God able to deliver you out of the lion's den? And Daniel says, oh, king, live forever. <laughs> Hallelujah. My God came and he shut. By his angels, he sent his angels to shut the mouths of the lion. And then those that laid the snare for his feet, they got to try out and see if their God shut the mouths of the lions, and it didn't work for them. 
I tell you what, God will take care of you. You do not have to be your defender. You do not have to take care of yourself because God will take care of you. And I can't help it, but I've got to go into David. And what David went through, here Samuel comes, and, he, and when the Spirit of the Lord was taken from Saul because of his disobedience, here the, the prophet comes to David and he pours out the anointing oil upon David and says, God has anointed you, this young man, as king over Israel. First to get to that place, God tried him. He sent a bear after the sheep. And Daniel, by the anointing, the power, I mean, David, by the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit, he slew the bear and he slew the lion. And then he went after Goliath after that, after he was anointed. And, you know, here he goes under the anointing and the authority, the anointing placed upon him. He goes after Goliath and persecution from his brothers. What are you doing here, David? Who do you think you are? You're just being, you're just being naughty. You have no place here. Get out of here. You're not a man of war. He goes, well, you guys are just a bunch of chickens. I mean, this isn't how he said it, but, I mean, we could go and read the Scripture and we'd be here for a while. So we're just condensing it all in. He said, but I know in whom I have believed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm taking that from Job. But anyway, he was right there in that same frame of mind. He trusted in God. He said, who is this uncircumcised full of stain? I'll go after him. And, and you know, Goliath says, I'm going to feed, I'm going to feed you to the birds today. And, and David says, you come, you come to me with sword and shield, but I come to you in the name of the almighty God, the king of heaven. I come to you with the power and the demonstration of the Holy Ghost and fire. And he took down that giant that the whole army of Israel was running from. One young man that said, I will stand and I will trust and I will believe and I will obey God. Yeah. And the whole enemy of Israel fled that day from the face of Israel from one young man willing to stand in the face of certain death as far as man sees. Everybody else, men were just seeing a shepherd boy. His father and his brethren only saw a shepherd boy. But God saw a king in the making. God saw a man after his own heart. God saw a man that was hungry for the anointing, that spent time before the father worshiping him. Out of that worship, out of that relationship, out of that fellowship is, is how David killed the bear, the lion, and Goliath. And conquered. But David went through so much more trial and persecution. He was running from Saul. Saul doesn't have the anointing of God anymore. David has the anointing. What's going on here? Lord, you anointed me king. I mean, man would, would, would get there and try to figure it all out and get all disappointed in the situation. But when you stay in rela relationship and fellowship with the Father and not in religion and going over into your mind trying to figure it all out and arguing the circumstance, but just trusting that the Lord in His perfect plan and in His perfect time is going to bring you to the place that you need to be, to the place that He's called you. Oh, hallelujah. And then... You know, you look at David after he's made king, after God has tried him in that fire, tried him, and then placed him up to be king. David, in the place of that responsibility before all of Israel, that great responsibility that he carried by the anointing of the Holy Ghost, fell greatly. He fell greatly. And he committed treason against God. When we sin, it's not against other men as much as it is against God. And he committed that treason of adultery. And then adultery led to murder. 
And then that murder, that blood that was upon his hands kept him from building the temple of God. That great desire that he had in his heart, that God had put in his heart to build the temple, was taken from him because of the blood of Uriah upon his hands. But what happened when the prophet Nathan came before David and he was in this great big mess that he had made? You know, none of us, even when we are placed in that place of authority that God's called each and every one of us to, and and some of us have a greater calling in this place than others, and I tell you what, you undergird those with great callings upon their life because Satan will come out to try to stop them. Satan will try to come out to try to make them a, a, a laughing stock because there's a great and mighty call upon their life. You undergird them. You, you, you don't go and you bash them. You undergird them because the anointing and the power and the presence of God is upon them. And there's a great persecution of the enemy to stop them from the purposes and the plans of God. But as Nathan comes before David and he calls him out on it, and I, I mean, it, it, it's got to be a little bit that David's backslidden to be able to get into the, the situation to do what he did. He had to get a little bit cold here. He couldn't have been just in the presence of the Lord worshiping. There had to be some coldness going on to draw him to that place that he would commit such act. He had to get wrapped up in his situation. But as Nathan comes before him and tells him of the man with the one little ewe lamb and then the man that had herds and flocks, but yet took the 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 man, the poor man's one little ewe lamb to himself, And David was angry at what had happened and said, you know, he's going to repay him and and he's going to die on top of it. And then Nathan goes, David, you are the man. You are the man. David doesn't go into justifying himself and continuing the sin any longer. Right then it was broken. The power of darkness that would set against David to take down his kingdom. Because he was tried just like Saul and just like the rest of them that were before and after him. There was a trying place for him to either choose to humble himself before the Almighty or to bring a huge mess with his life and and, and, and lose his seed sitting upon the throne forever and ever because that that would have been what happened to David. God would have raised up another God's called you. If you will fulfill your purposes and your plans for God, he will, it will be you. But if you turn from what God's called you to do, he will raise up another. But he's chosen you. He's chosen you. Be found faithful. And if you fall, be like David and humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and repent and let God turn it around. Because God, a broken and a contrite spirit, God will not despise. He receives that brokenness. He receives that humility. Ahab, the most wicked king upon the planet, had done more wickedness than any other king ever. When Ahab heard the word of the Lord from Elijah the prophet, he humbled himself in sackcloth and ashes. He had been so wicked. And God looks at him humbling himself in sackcloth and ashes and says, look, look at how Ahab humbles himself. I will not bring this judgment upon him. What a merciful, loving God we serve. I mean, that is beyond us. Because men, in their own way, They want to take it down. We look at how Jonah handled it. Jonah did not want Nineveh to repent. He was upset about it. They were his enemies. They had done so much evil to Israel and he was angry with them. And God probably chose uh, Jonah because he was really angry with them. And he wanted to teach him how much he loves. But Jonah already knew it. And so he didn't want to go to Nineveh because he knew that God would be so merciful to Nineveh. And Jonah said, no, I'm not going. And God said, you are too. And Jonah couldn't go anywhere without getting 
in trouble. He went the opposite direction. And the storm came, and they threw him over ship. And the well came and spit him out on dry land. And by that time, when he got vomited up by the well, he was ready to do something. Because he was going to Nineveh. He was going. That's one time that God says, I don't care how far you run, you're going. You're doing what I'm telling you to do. The goodness and the love of God. And of course, Nineveh, the wicked, wicked city, Nineveh, that was so wicked that God says, I have to destroy it because their wickedness has come up before me. And that city must be destroyed. And it must be pretty wicked because we see how bad Sodom and Gomorrah got before God came and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was very wicked. I mean, to the point that when the angels uh, came in, that they were trying to get to the angels. They were so deprived by evil, wicked sin and so blinded by the powers of darkness that they were trying to get to the angels of God. So Nineveh had to be a very wicked city. But the mercy of God, the mercy of God, that mercy of God that as soon as David repented, he was forgiven. Yes, there was judgment because of what he did. Sin brings forth death. Sin brings forth death. Sin causes a mess. It causes a mess. And there's consequences that have to be paid. But yet at the same time, God, in God, in his love and his mercy, he brings restoration in every bit of a mess that we may make in our life if we will turn it to God. He will turn the thing around and make some kind of good in the situation. <laughs> and show forth his glory on our behalf just because we humble ourselves. Oh, what a loving Savior we serve. Oh, what a glorious God we serve. So I don't care where you've been and what you've done. And God doesn't care. Today, walk humbly before your God and take up that anointing and that call of God that he's placed upon your life. Don't waste any more time fussing about the situation. But be a Daniel, a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, a Joseph, a Jacob, an Abraham. And just be obedient to God starting today. Don't argue about where God has you. Say, here I am. Take all of me. I pour out my life on you, Jesus. Lord, come reign in me. Oh, Father, once again, come let your fire burn in me. We thank God that there's not one person in this place that is a Saul. Hallelujah. Saul, the Holy Spirit, was taken from him because of his disobedience. And there was no more hope for Saul as far as we know and we understand because the anointing, the presence of God was taken from him. And maybe because it was, at the, it was to the point that God saw so much pride in Saul for where, where God had placed Saul as king, brought him out, and as just a man without too much, he was, he was shy and, and, and a timid man and God placed the anointed of a, anointing upon him and made him king. And evidently pride so gripped Saul's heart that we never saw repentance, but we only saw self-justification for his situation. There is no justification for sin. There's only repentance or damnation. There's only two ways. Humility and repentance are damnation for your self-justification. Self-justification will get you nowhere but to hell. So anyway, we want to get back over here to the calling and the purposes of God that he has placed upon our life. Let's look at, at Matthew chapter 4. And we just can look at the beginning the beginning of where Jesus began to do after he was baptized by John in the river Jordan and the Holy Ghost came upon him. Uh, whoo, the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost comes on you. When the Holy Ghost comes on you. You want to stay in that fire and that glory of the Holy Ghost because that is the equipping power, the enduing power to go and be a witness, this kind of a witness. First of all, Jesus was led up into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan. 
kind of reminds you a little bit of what Joseph went through. But Jesus was over, uh, only there for 40 days. Joseph was, he was in prison how long? How long did it take David to become king? How long did it take Jacob to go through the things, to work things out in him? How long, how long did God put Moses on the, uh, on the backside of the desert to work out everything that he had learned in Egypt? Jesus, 40 days tempted of the devil, passing every time. You know, and here comes Satan. And Satan's real good with this in religion. Here comes Satan. You hear a religious person outside of relationship, they can quote the Scripture. They can quote the Scripture for their good and for their benefit. But it's nothing more than pure religion because Satan quotes it too. Satan quotes it for his benefit. And it don't mean nothing when people quote the Scripture. It doesn't mean anything. Is there a relationship and is there power, is there glory, is there, is there might and the presence of the Holy Ghost upon them or are they just a bunch of religious people that have walked away from God and become like the scribes and the Pharisees that killed and persecuted the Almighty God when He came to earth? Religion persecuted and killed Jesus. And they could quote a lot of scripture. They could outquote any person in this place. They had, they had the Torah memorized by the time they were seven years old. They could quote the scripture. And they killed their Messiah. So what good did it do them outside of relationship? It became religion to them. It became whether you washed your hands or not, or if you washed the pot right or not, or if you did this or that the other right or not. And they could quote all of the things that you were supposed to do. But they had no relationship with the Almighty God. They had none. None because they could not hear His voice when He stood before them and His voice came like the, 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 the sound of many waters. But they could not hear the sound of many waters because their hearts were hardened and their eyes were blinded and there was a veil across their eyes and their heart because... They had gotten caught up in their own life and had become hard, still, cold-hearted, uncircumcised, religious Pharisees and scribes. Yes, they were circumcised in the flesh, but they were not circumcised in the heart. They did not love the Lord their God with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind. They weren't lost in fellowship and relationship with them, with him. They were caught up in religion. I don't care how fiery of a church you sit in, you can get caught up in, rela in religion if you're not on fire for God for yourself. If you're not pouring out yourself on Jesus. Everybody around you can be pouring themselves out on Jesus and being getting touched by the power of God and the glory of God. And you can sit there and think nothing is going on. You can't hear the sound of many waters and you won't hear the trumpet of the Lord when it sounds either. You'll be left sitting right there. I saw this thing of a church the other day, and they was talking about the, um, the rapture of the church. And they were all in there, and they were worshiping God, and then the preacher began to preach on the rapture of the church. And then suddenly, boom, this light shined, and you know it all turned real bright, and then the light turned down, and the whole church just about is gone, but there's like 10 people left scattered all throughout the church. So you know that they were sitting in a fiery church in this example that was put on, I don't know, I think I saw it YouTube or something. I don't even know how I got to it. But anyway, there's, there's like 10 people left in this fiery church. And I tell you, it's probably going to be a whole lot more left in most churches. People that are just, they come into church, they come into church just to Check in. Push in their time clock. Just, you know, I want to be, as they would say, religious enough to make it to heaven. I want to know just enough Jesus to get to heaven, but I want to live my own life. If we do not lose our life, we will not find it. You must lose your life to find it. But I tell you what, the gain is so much greater in losing 
because you really don't lose. You win. You gain. You really gain in this life and in the life to come because you walk around in peace that passes all understanding while everybody else is walking around in turmoil. She was telling me about how the people in Japan are so anxious and worried and concerned about their life and, and, and there's you know a high suicide rate. He didn't tell me that, but I've heard that. There's a high suicide rate and, and people are just in turmoil. They're not happy. Why? Because they have no relationship with the one who takes our yoke and makes it easy, who gives us his light burden for our heavy burden. Oh, they need somebody. They need somebody with power and demonstration and the glory of heaven to come and show them the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God has called every one of us to be trained up right here in our Jerusalem to be able to go out into the uttermost parts of the earth and to preach the gospel. And how much time do we have left to make sure these people hear the word of the Lord? I tell you, today is the moment and the time Today is the moment and the time that God has called this church, this ministry to arise and shine and let the glory of God be revealed in San Diego like never before. We've done so much in this city and we've push, pushed back the powers of darkness and we've taken ground again and again. But God says, okay, you've been found faithful in these few things. You took those five talents and, and, you, and you put it to use and you gained five more talents. Now I'm going to give you a little bit more. What are you going to do with those talents? Are you going to hide the talents? Are you going to be like the person with the one talent and go and bury that talent in the, in the ground for fear of holding on to your own life? Are you going to be fearful and hold on to what you have? Or are you going to put what you have? Are you going to take all of you and put it into the kingdom of heaven from this moment on? Will this be the first day of the rest of your life to run after the things of the kingdom and not let go again for the rest of your life for all eternity? Will this be, this year, 2014, this first day, will it be the day that you decide right here, no more picking up those things that I think that I need to do? I will put the kingdom of heaven first in all things. I will not put my business, I will not put my work, I will not put my tiredness, I will not put anything. I'll have no other God before me. I will put kingdom business above everything. January 1st, 2014. Here I am, Lord. Are we saying that with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our being? Are we saying, here I am, Lord, take all of me. I now take all that I have, just like Mary did. She took her dowry. She took all that she had to be able to marry and have more in life. She took it all and she poured it out on Jesus just to worship him, just to worship him one time, just to stand there and worship him, to have that opportunity to worship him one time. She poured out. A year's wages, her dowry, what would enable her to be able to marry and to go on in life and have a family just so she could worship him once. That is amazing. Well, our amazing God says, whatever we give in this life and whatever we give up and whatever we lay down, we'll have a hundredfold in the life to come and in this life a hundredfold both in the life to come and in this life. The rich young ruler didn't wait around to listen to that. He didn't wait around to hear it. He held on to his life and he lost it all. And we've only just begun. We've only just begun. We've labored many years. We've pressed in for many things. We've done so much. We've given and we've given and we've... We, we've We've been here to 4 o'clock in the morning many nights and night after night hosting meetings and, 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 and uh, seeing the power of God touch thousands of people in San Diego and, and, and from the nearby areas and people that even fly in from other states. And we've labored in the kingdom, but we've only just begun. We've only just begun. 
Today is not the time to now begin to hold on to your life, but today is the day to say, I'm letting go of all of it. And I tell you, as you let go of it, God will bring and add unto you those things that you need. He will bring, you don't go and you don't seek after what you think you need. Finances. You don't go seek after those things with your heart. You let God add that to you. You let God place you in the place that you're supposed to be. You don't seek after it. That's just God directs you to that place. You don't seek after who, who God wants you to marry. You, see, you let God place that with you. You don't go after it. You let God do it. You let God work his miracles on the inside of you while you're seeking first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And then his promises, all these things, all these things, all these things shall be added unto you. If you go after it, you might find yourself way in debt and a huge big mess. Seek first the kingdom of God. He'll take care of all that you have need of. But here, here is Jesus after he's, he's baptized He's baptized in the Jordan, and he's baptized in the Holy Ghost, and he's tried for 40 days. It says in verse chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, and from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus went walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two brothers Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said unto them, Come and follow me, and I will make you fisher of men. Father saying, Come and follow me, and I will make you fisher of men. And then straightway, immediately it says, they left their nets and they went and followed Jesus. Immediately. They didn't say, wait and let us deal with this catch, and wait and let us fix this, and let us go home and, and kiss the wife and love on the kids, and or whatever, immediately they heard that voice of thunder in their heart that captivated them, that they were constrained to obey. You know, it says his voice is the voice of many waters. And those that hear sense that glorious presence, and it is the voice of many waters to them. It's a voice that they cannot, they cannot turn away from because their heart is tender and broken and humble before their God. And he choo you know, here's Jesus, he chooses fishermen. He doesn't choose those that know the letter of the law because they're too puffed up in their own head. He doesn't want to take 20 years trying to get through to them. He chooses a simple fisherman. So it doesn't matter if you're uneducated. It's probably better. It's okay. God can come and use you. He can put his Holy Ghost upon you and you can do things that um, nobody else can do because you're so willing to just listen to the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost knows a whole lot more than the most educated person on the planet. And he takes the, the, the meek and the simple and the, the things that look ugly and he makes them, he chooses to make them mighty. Hallelujah. Just that brokenness, that humility. And I'm never going to get through this. And straightway they left their nets and they followed him. And he goes on and he calls other disciples and he tells them to come and follow them, and follow him. And immediately they leave the ship and their father and they followed him. Maybe the father wasn't too happy. Maybe he was. Maybe he was excited that Jesus called him. But they just bailed on him. And they went and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness. The power of the Holy Ghost. Healing, teaching, preaching the gospel. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. And his fame went throughout all of Syria and they brought unto him all the sick people that were taken with many diseases and torments and those that were possessed with devils and those that were lunatic and those that had the palsy, and he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and beyond Jordan. They all came out. His fame went, went throughout all the regions around about. 
because he came with demonstration and power. And he said to us, what did he say to his disciples? He says, go, go and wait for the promise of the Father. And then we find in Acts where it says, Acts chapter 1. Verse 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is upon you, comes upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and in the uttermost parts of the earth. This is what the Holy Ghost does. We say, yes, we have the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit, when he comes on a man, he sends him forth with power and majesty and might. And he causes them to be a witness even unto the death. And we can look at the, we can look at the 11 disciples. Peter crucified upside down for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. He gave himself, but when he was old, you know, Jesus prophesied to him. He says, when you're old, they will carry you where you would not go. And told of his death that was to come. And we look... We can look at John. John, we don't know when he died, but he was boiled in oil, and that didn't work. So then they marooned him out on the Isle of Patmos where there was nothing but rock. There was no vegetation. There was no way to live. There was no animals out there, and he wouldn't starve. He wouldn't boil. He wouldn't starve. You know why? Because until God is done with you, he'll keep you. As long as you're an obedient servant, you don't have to worry about something coming against your body. Something comes against you, stand. And having done all, stand. And if you need to repent, then repent. Because, you know, there were many that came and took communion. And the scripture says there was many sick among them because they took the communion unworthily because they had all kinds of stuff going on in the middle of the church because why false prophets entered in and there was all kinds of stuff going on. The enemy, he always sets up whispers and those that will get you caught up in all kinds of lies and garbage. And then so many were sick and even some died because they didn't humble themselves and repent and get rid of the stuff. So you get sick, just have a repenting service and, and get healed. And, and then keep your tongue, keep your heart with all diligence. Keep your mouth from evil and let your tongue that speak no guile and keep your heart with all diligence. And anyways, I don't know, I need to go back up here because then I get over there, I get over here um, talking about stuff that people are allowing going on in their lives. So if I get back up here, I can um, not be too close and, 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 and preach the message. <laughs> but what the Holy Ghost is doing is making us a witness. And if you don't feel like you're a witness with power, say, Father, baptize me afresh in the fire of the Holy Ghost. Because this is the commission. We can go and we can look. I don't know what time it is. But we can go and look real quick. And I, and I, will, I will try. As I told the guy at the restaurant the other night, uh, last night, as we were sitting fellowshipping with um, Japan. I was, I'm excited about fellowshipping with Japan and learning about what God's doing in Japan and about what God wants us to do in Japan. And I know, you know, number one, it's an intercede for God to break that country and bring that, that country to a place that they will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ with, and, and to raise up labors with signs, wonders, and miracles to go and show forth the glory of God. Not, not a gospel that's a gospel of the tongue with no demonstration, but just what we read and the Holy Ghost shall come upon you. The glory. And you will be a witness with power and might. Go and heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils. This is it right here. Right here in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things. Whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you, even unto the end of the world. And uh, we'll just real quickly run over to 
Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. At least they get the opportunity and they're not dying by the scores of thousands daily around the world with never having the opportunity of hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. For which, I mean, that's heart-rending. They never have the opportunity to hear the gospel and they die and they go to hell for all eternity, but yet the blood drips from the fingers of those that were called to go and preach that gospel and never went, never were obedient their souls and their blood will be required at our hand. For what God, what God commissions us to do here in San Diego, and each one of you, you have, to, you have to deal with that in your own heart. Whatever God calls us to do right here in San Diego, if we do not fulfill what God's called us to do, the blood of those that God purposed for us to reach will drip from our hands. We have a huge responsibility because we've been endued and empowered by the Holy Spirit, we cannot allow the enemy to snare us with riches and cares and pleasures of this world or with any distraction of being thrown in a pit by our, our family or cast into prison or, or, or whatever else could cause us to wrap ourselves up into a little ball and whine and act like a baby when uh, he's endued us with power. We're, we've been endued with power. There's no whining around him. He lives on the inside of us. His glory is revealed on the inside of us. You have all power to stand against the lying power of whining and complaining and the poor me's. So rise up in the authority and the majesty and the power and the might that he has given you in Christ Jesus by the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Rise up, people. Rise up. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. The power gospel. This gospel must be preached. This gospel, the power gospel, Jesus came preaching a gospel of power and demonstration and commissioned us to preach the same gospel. In the name of Jesus, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay the hands on, their hands on the sick and they shall recover. And then after that, after the Lord gave that commission, he was taken up in heaven. He says, okay, now my work is done. Now I've commissioned you to go. First go wait for the promise. And then when you're endued, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Hallelujah. And I thank you, Father, that you brought us here for this hour and this time. You've raised us up. Father, I pray that not one person that you have placed in this ministry, not one person that you brought here will hold onto their life and count their own life dear or look at what they've already been through and say, I've been through too much hardship and I can't go on, I can't do it anymore. Father, that not one person, Father God, will fall off and not fulfill this great call that you've placed upon us. But every one of us will get upon our knees and we will seek you. And we will call out to you for what place you want us to be. And we will show up when it's time for us to gather together and go and preach the gospel. And also on our own, Lord Jesus, as we seek your face, Lord, and you bring those people before us in our jobs or just in our everyday, whatever we're doing, Father, that we will speak and declare the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Hallelujah. And I was talking about when we were with the, the Japanese last night, how um, we were trying to get out of the restaurant. We were the last ones sitting at the table. Table, you know, it was a packed out place, and table after table's clearing. And I told the waiter, I'm like, well, you know, we're trying, we're trying to finish. I go, but we're having a really good time fellowshipping. And I said, like, like we do in church, um, when it's, uh, we, we start closing and we close about nine times before we actually close. Because it's just so, it's so hard to turn away from the communion and the fellowship of what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. And you know, when the 
when, when you have a church and the people sit here and they're pulling on the anointing and, and they're hungry for what the Father's saying and, and there's change being brought forth, it's hard to ever stop because people are hungry and they want to hear and the Holy Spirit will just keep pouring out. And like I've said to many people that have been visiting recently, I said, we don't have church as long as we used to. You know, we, we stop early for the sakes of other people. And they're like, you stop early? This is early? I'm like, yeah, we, we, we normally went on to midnight. You know, we, our church used to be Sunday morning, went to about 3 or 4 o'clock, and we broke for a little bit to go grab some dinner, and we were right back at 5 for prayer. And then we'd stay till 1 o'clock in the morning. And then nobody, and then you get up and nobody wants to go home. Everybody just hung out to the church for another hour or so. And I mean, it's still like that. It is the abiding place. We named it, we prophesy the abiding place, and people just come and they stay. And then when church is over, they just keep staying, and nobody wants to leave because we love the glory and the presence of the Most High. Oh, hallelujah. And Father, we just thank you that the anointing increases. We thank you, Father, that this anointing increases and it spreads like a wildfire throughout this city, oh God. And people, when they come in this place, that they will be so hungry because they will see the presence and the glory of God upon us. And Father God, that they, they will become the abiding place and they will abide in your presence and they won't want to leave, they'll want to stay. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for fresh fire. The fresh fire of the Holy Ghost upon every person. The fresh fire of the Holy Ghost upon every person in this place tonight, Lord. Fresh fire. Father, baptize us, O oh God, in the fire of the Holy Ghost. Baptize, O oh God, in the fire of the Holy Ghost. Oh God, the fullness of all that you have, that we can be a witness, that we can shine forth bright, O oh God, with your glory, with power and demonstration. Let us settle for nothing less, nothing, nothing less than all that you have. Nothing less, oh God, than all that you have. Father, your glory, your glory manifested to us, in us, and through us. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. We praise you, Father, for your anointing. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh, Father, you know, we just want to worship the Lord with all that we have and all that we are. We want to worship him with everything that is within us. <laughs> oh, Jesus. every part of our life. We want to pour ourselves out completely upon Him with our time, with our spirit, with our attitude, with our works, with, with everything that we do, with what we have, with our possessions. We want to pour ourselves out on Him that He can take what we give Him and multiply it. He can multiply his righteousness within us, that it can increase more and more. We just stand and we just say, here I am, Lord. I give it to you. Take what I have. Lord, I am just a man or I'm just a woman. I'm just a human. But Lord, I stand and I give you my mouth. I give you myself. Lord, coming and preaching and ministering before your people, it's too big for me. It's too much for me. But here I stand in obedience and I give myself to you, Lord. You take my mouth and you guide it. You guide it. You make my tongue like a pen of a, uh, of a ready writer. You, Lord, take this vessel because I come and I stand and I yield myself up to you as a living sacrifice to speak. And you do your work. That's how we can go and we can witness to those that are around us as we pray in the Holy Ghost and we feel the fire of God. We can say, Lord, it's too big for me to speak to this person, but Lord, I hear you calling me to open my mouth. And Lord, I, I don't even know where to begin, but Father, you make my tongue like the tongue of a ready writer. Father, you anoint me. To, to, to speak. Father, I don't know how to knock on somebody's door and say, is there anybody here I can pray for? I mean, what am I going to do when I go in there and I pray for them? Lord, it's, it's too big for me. But Father, here I am. I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. And Lord, my mouth is saying, is there anybody here that we can pray for? How can we help you? Lord, here I am. You do. You show forth your glory. You do your work. 
Here I am, Lord. I'm willing. It's too big for me. It's hard. I can't do this on my own. But I come and I stand in obedience to those that, are, that you've placed over my life and I will do what they say and I will let you use me. I may be shaking in my boots and my knees knocking as I'm standing there knocking on that first door. But here I am, Lord. I'm here. I'm here. Now, God, you take this and somehow use it. The Lord had to work on me a long time to get me as a woman to get up and minister because I didn't like women preachers. I did not. I, did, I would turn them off if they were on the TV. I wasn't interested. Isn't that amazing? I didn't like to hear women preach. I like to hear men preach. I like men to be the head. That's just how I am. And I'm pushing my husband. My husband can minister amazingly. I don't know, you know, when you're going to get to hear him teach, but it's going to happen. Anyway, I was saying no, no, no. And God put his word in me like fire shut up in his bones, like, Little Ruth Anna, she, she's kind of like been one that says, no, no, no. But you look at her as she worships, and it's like fire shut up in, his, in her bones. And I tell you what, Lord, uh, Ruth Anna, don't you let anything stop you because the glory of God is so on you to lead people over into the realms of his glory. Oh, and it, you know, God doesn't look at the outward appearance. He doesn't look at what other people see. Uh, other pe people may see a shepherd boy. They may just see a, a young woman. But God, he looked at David as that young boy and he saw a king. Every one of you, every one of you, as you just yield yourself, there's that place of an anointing for you that God has placed upon you. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. Just say, here I am, Lord. I'll be obedient right here to this place that you've given me. And God will take that. He will take that and he will make greatness out of it. But think it not strange concerning the fiery trials that come to try you. Don't think it's strange. Because Joseph went through them and David went through them and Jacob went through them and we have all the patriarchs to look at. We have Paul to look at. He was stoned, left for dead. Probably was dead. But God wasn't done, so he got back up and kept going. God's not done with you till you're dead. And don't worry about when you die. He'll take care of that. Don't, be con don't concern yourself about whether you're going to die or not. Or when you're going to die. Just be so busy in the kingdom that you don't even have time to think about it. And then God will take you when he's finished. And until then, if you're busy about the kingdom, you could not even have a heart and you'd keep living. Because God can, God can take a person that doesn't even have a womb and bring forth a child and then bring forth another child. God can take what's impossible with man and make greatness out of it. It's just you keep, you keep doing what God's called you to do. And you can't starve. You can't boil. You can't die. If you're disobedient, you can. But as long as you're busy in the kingdom, God's going to fulfill his purposes in you. And the spiritual things way outweigh the physical. Way outweigh the physical. And you get so lost in the realms of the presence of God, you'll be glad for this mortal to put on immortality. Because you raptured over in that realm anyway, and you just can't wait to behold him. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. I just want to give everybody the opportunity. I'm sorry, Pastor Stewart was supposed to come and minister on the offering. I had asked him to before service, and here we are. You know what, Stuart? I know, you know, if there's something in your heart that you want to you wanna go after right now.
I just want you to flow in the Holy Ghost. I don't think anybody's in too big of a rush. Because here we are. Lord, you're so good. Your word is so good. It's so wonderful to hear the anointing of your Holy Ghost Mm, moving upon us in your presence, O Lord, drawing us nearer unto you in that relationship, Father, to hear about those mighty people of valor, O God, who each one had a relationship with you, who each one had a heart given over to seeking after you, a heart given over, O Lord God, to knowing you, each one understanding that they brought nothing and you gave them everything they had. Lord, in like manner, we have a relationship with you, that relationship in Jesus. We mean we've received from you everything that is the life of Christ Jesus. And we have really brought nothing to that relationship. Everything we have comes from you. The scripture tells us that a man can have nothing except he receive it from God. And if you have not received it from God, you have nothing to give. When Jesus talked about giving, and he talked in in Luke chapter 6, and he talked about press, you know, he said, if you give and it shall be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men heap under your bosom. We we think all the time about money, and it it applies to money. But if you read it in context, it's, it's much more than that. It's giving of everything that you have received of Him. So you give of the Word of God. You give of healing. You give of of the power of God. You give of the anointing that God's given unto you. We go forth from this place to give unto everyone we meet and to give them something. Even, you know, we we make light of it, but even something as simple as just a smile and an I love you. It's something that just encourages people. It's, that's a little thing to start with. There's so much more. What he's talking about is take the word of God that's been put in with you, the things that you've heard by the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and then to go forth and to give them unto others as they have need. You see somebody sick and you give them what God's given you. He's given you healing. He's touched your body. He's touched your life. Now you say, look, let me pray. And you pray in Jesus' name. You begin to ask the Lord to minister it and to strengthen it in your life in the same way that you take of your money and you bring it to the offering and you say, Lord, I'm giving this to you out of relationship. I'm giving of my tithe. I'm giving of my offering. I'm giving to the poor. I'm giving to the ministry, whatever it is. And you know that it's going to be returned unto you in the same way when I take of that healing that I've received and I give it God's going to allow it to come back and it's going to get stronger. We hear preachers tell us, you got to get moving so you can give. You've got to go do it, then God will give you more. You, if you don't go to give it out, you'll never have anything more to give because you've got to make room for God to bless you. He's going to send more to you. So when you get your offering ready, we, we're, we focus on the money and we need to at times. Because it's that first place where you take of what you have, you take of your strength, you take of your substance. In the Old Testament, they would take of their cattle, they would take their sheep, and they would turn it into smoke. And they would burn it on an altar before the Lord, and they would offer it to Him as a testimony that everything that they received, everything of the strength of their herd, everything of the strength of their life was given unto God. And then they would testify of the greatest offering that we bring, which is Jesus Christ. He has given unto us a place to offer unto him of of everything that he has given unto us. So when we come before the Father, we come with the sacrifice of Jesus, the blood that he shed, the life that he gave and has given unto us. So wrapping all of that together, out of that relationship, We see Jacob testifying, because you've blessed me, Lord, and I think it's Genesis 28, because you've blessed me, I'm going to give you a tenth of everything I receive as a testimony that I've received everything from you. As we come into this place, we we bring the sacrifice of Jesus. And we say, Lord, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for the blood that washes me, cleanses me from all sin. I thank you for his life that you put within me. I thank you for the stripes he bore for my healing. So when you bring your money, 
You don't just bring your money. You bring your whole life. It's your offering. You bring everything about your offering. And you lay it before the Lord as a testimony. You say, Father, as a testimony unto you, I say that everything I have, I've received from you. My very breath is yours. My very life is yours. And I testify of it every time I come up here and I put an offering into the basket. I'm testifying, Lord, everything I have is yours. There's nothing that I have that I've earned. There's nothing that I have that belongs to me. There's nothing that I have that I've obtained by my own strength. Everything I have, you gave me because you gave me life. So this is what we do. So get your offering ready. Lay your heart before the Lord. Do it with rejoicing. Give thanks unto the Lord. And say, Father, everything I have belongs to you in Jesus' name. And let him know that he that converteth a sinner from the error of his ways has saved a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Hallelujah. What a gift. What a gift. He that converts a sinner has saved a soul from death. Thank you, Jesus. As David sings, Here I Am, and we worship the Lord, we stand and we worship the Lord with Here I Am, take all of me. If anybody needs prayer for any reason, you can come and we will pray for you. If anybody wants a fresh baptism of the fire of the Holy Ghost, <laughs> come and we'll pray for you. Otherwise, you can join with us and sing, Here I Am, Lord. With all of your heart. Here I am. Take all of me. I pour out my life. All of you, Jesus. Oh, here I am. Take all of me. I pour out my life on you, Jesus. Here I am, take all of me, I pour out my life on you, Jesus. Oh, here I am, take all of me, I pour out my life on you, Jesus. I will follow you. I will follow you. I will follow you.
and I will follow you. I will follow you. I will follow you. Lord Jesus, here I am. Take all of me. I pour out my life. Oh. Take all of me. I pour out my life on you, Jesus. Take all of me. I pour out my life on you, Jesus. Oh, here I am. Take all of me. I pour out my life on you, Jesus. Oh, I hold nothing back. I'll hold nothing back from you. I'll hold nothing back from you. Use me, Lord Jesus. I'll hold nothing back from you. I'll hold nothing back from you. I'll hold nothing back from you. Use me, Lord Jesus. I'll hold nothing back from you. I'll hold nothing back from you. I'll hold nothing back from you. Use me, Lord Jesus. Lord, send your fire now. 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 Lord, send your fire. Lord, send your fire now. 
Lord, send your fire now. Lord, send your fire 